Yeah, so um, I forgot to add this part. <laughs> it, you know, that's what I'm saying. Just reasoning, you know, because scriptures, scriptures alone. All right, let me just, let me just let me just get to the point. <laughs> when the prophets saw visions of God on the throne, I already addressed this, right? That they only saw one entity on the throne. They didn't see three entities on the throne. And now someone can say, yeah, well, is is they're not going to see three entities on the throne because it's three and one. You know, they they they're, they're the same or whatever. Well. If you say that, then why is it that when Christ died and was resurrected to heaven, it wasn't one entity they saw on the throne, but they saw two entities now. Remember, after Christ died and went to heaven, now both Paul and Stephen saw visions of heaven, including John. Well, Paul and Stephen saw visions of Christ in heaven, and they both said that Christ is seated at the right-hand side of God. So if Christ is God, when he goes back to heaven, he's supposed to be God again. So whereas there was one entity on the throne, but it's three and one, but it's one. Well, now it's not three entities on one throne where it's just one person, but now it's two people sitting side by side. So, and again, where is the Holy Spirit in this? You see how the Holy Spirit has been left out? Where is the Holy Spirit in this? So what? God is now God and the Holy Spirit, and Christ is now seated at the right-hand side of God and the Holy Spirit, but God and the Holy Spirit are one, but Christ is not one with God, but he is separate because he's seated at the right-hand side of God. Which one is it? Okay, now, when the prophets saw visions of angels, if the angels looked like they were three in one, they mentioned it. A cherubim has four faces. They said, yeah, the cherubim has four wings. The cherubim is a spirit creature. It has is 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 chrysolite in color. It has eyes all around the four wings, and they have wheels. All the wheels have eyes all around them. They have four faces: the face of a man, the face of a bull, the face of an eagle, and the face of a lion. Whether that's literal or whether it's symbolic for personality traits or characteristics of a cherubim, we do not know. But they at least said it. So now we see, okay, a cherubim, could it could mean that cherubim is four persons in one. It could mean that. It could mean that they have four different personalities. Or it could mean that they literally look like that. Whatever it is that we want to take it as, why didn't they characterize God as being someone who has three faces because he's three in one? Why didn't they make it seem like he had three personalities in one being? This whole idea of a tr Trinitarian God never came into the picture until the Dark Ages, where we are warned that wolves are coming into the congregation to distort the messages, the truth, the truthful messages of Scripture. Yet you still take in this Trinity doctrine as if it's a fact. Christ said, me and my Father are one. He didn't say, me, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are one. And when he says, me and my father are one, isn't the man and the woman one? Christ said, the man will leave his father and his mother and will stick to his wife and the two will become one. Does a man become the woman? Okay, you would say, well, no, they don't. it, it doesn't mean that they're, they're, they're the same person. Just like the Trinity doesn't mean they're the same person, but they're just one. Okay, well, so then you mean they're one in equality, right? Okay, so is the man equal to the woman? Is that what Christ meant when he said the man and the woman will become one? Does he, does he, is he, is he, is he, is he talking about equality? Well, of course not, because the Bible clearly says that a woman's head is the man. That means the man is above the woman. They're, they're not equal in authority. And the, the man's head is Christ. So the Christ, so, so the man is, is, is subject to Christ. Just as the woman is subject to the man. So the man is not equal to the woman. Just as much as the man is not equal to God. I mean, is not equal to Christ. But then the Bible also says that Christ's head is God. So the woman is subject to man. Just as man is subject to Christ. Just as Christ is subject to God. What does this mean if, it does, if it's not talking about non-equality? What else does it mean? If, 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 if the woman is subject to the man... And Christ is subject to God, but the man is not is not the woman, and the man is not equal in authority to the woman. Then how can we attribute those same characteristics to Christ and God when we clearly see that the Scripture says that Christ is subject to God? God has no head. Now I want you all to compare this very next verse that you're seeing on the screen. Compare this, compare this verse, read it, pause, read it, 
read it very carefully. Now compare it to this picture that I keep seeing on Facebook, on the internet. I have never seen any Trinitarian or forget about even that. I've never seen any picture of this, of, of what this picture is supposed to say. I've never seen this picture drawn accurately. It always ends with Christ or Jesus or it would skip Christ and put God. So obviously they're trying to say that Christ is God so they can just put God, right? So they ignore that Christ's head is God and they just, they just put Christ, right? So this is what Trinitarians do. I, 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 I challenge you to type in this verse on Google, look at the image section, and see if you will find a picture where they have the children, the woman, the man, Christ, and God. I guarantee you every single one of them is going to end with Christ. They completely ignore God in the picture. Completely and utterly. I mean... <laughs> oh, yo. Y'all are going to learn. Y'all are going to learn. Y'all are gonna learn. Y'all are gonna learn. Y'all are definitely gonna learn. And let's talk about the seraphim. The seraphim, the Bible describes what the seraphim looks like. It has six wings that goes around the throne of God. So they give these perfect analysis of these angels. But yet when they speak of God, you don't want to take their description of God as what it is. The description of God is what it is. He is one God. He is not three persons in one. And Christ says, I am not equal to my father. The father is greater than I am. He says, you can marvel at these things, but guess what? The Father, when I go, when I send to heaven, to my God and to your God and to my Father and to my Father, my God will show me greater works than these so that you may marvel. If Christ is God, then what is he talking about when he says, my God and Father will show me greater works than these? What is he talking about if he's not trying to tell you verbatim that his Father is greater than he is? Okay, so so scriptures aside, okay, scriptures aside, and, and and let me address one thing, one favorite thing that I love when when Christians try to tell me, which they're not really Christians, but when it, Christians tell me that Christ is God and He is the Holy Spirit, okay, no, Christ is not God. God is God, and the Holy Spirit is like God's active force. It's like His hand, okay, clearly. But one of the favorite things that I like to hear from them that they tell me is. Well, then why did Christ say that tear this temple down on the third day? I'll raise it up. Right? Because the Bible clearly says, clearly says that God raised Christ from the dead. But yet Christ said, tear this temple down and I'll raise it up in three days. I love it when they use this. You know why? They do not know the scriptures. One example, just to shut them up so, they could, so that they could all think and you all can all think. Whenever Christ healed somebody, what would he tell them? Now, the Bible says that God is going to raise Christ from the dead, right? And then Christ is saying he's going to raise himself from the dead. Okay, when a person is healed from their ailment, who, who healed them? God, right? Okay, but through Christ, right? Okay, but yet Christ tells a person, no, you have healed yourself by means of your faith. Whoa. You have healed yourself by means of your faith. Whoa. So, so you who are listening to this right now, 
You're sick. You're blind. You, you never saw in your life. Okay? You're, you're, you're lame. You never walked in your life. You're deaf. You never heard a thing in your life. You're mute. You can't speak. You never uttered a single phrase in your life. Then Christ takes away all those ailments. And he tells you, you have healed yourself by means of your faith. He tells you, your faith has made you well. He says, go away, my son, or go away, my daughter, for your faith has healed you. You have healed yourself by means of your faith. Is that blasphemy? Of course it's not. Christ is telling you that you healed yourself by means of your faith. But we know God healed you. We know Christ healed you by the power that God gave him. We know this as a fact, but yet Christ is telling you, nah, nah son, you healed yourself. Okay, so 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 again, like I'm saying, what that doesn't that doesn't that that doesn't come into the picture when we're talking about Christ saying that he healed himself from death. When Christ says that break this temple down, that's like me saying you could cripple my legs. OK, cripple my legs and I will and I will heal myself on the fourth day. After I make prayer and supplication to my God and Father, I will heal myself because of my faith. My faith has has made me well. My faith has made me walk again. Is that blasphemy? Of course it's not because Christ is telling me I can say that. He's telling me that that's what I've done. I've healed myself by means of my faith. So if Christ is saying, and mind you, if, if it's by means of faith that a person heals themselves, it is by means of faith that a person can resurrect himself. Who has greater faith in God than Christ? So if Christ is saying, break this, if Christ is saying, I am not my father and I am not equal to my father, that my father is greater than I am. And he's also saying in the same vein that tear this temple down and I will raise it up on the third day by means of my faith. Where is the lie? There is no lie. He did raise, resurrect himself from the dead because he had absolute faith that his father would resurrect him. OK, so that's just one side note for you to think about. For you to think about. And when Christ goes to heaven, when Christ goes to heaven. He has a God and Father. Revelation was given to Christ by God. Revelation 1 verse 1 tells you the revelation which God gave Christ, that, that Christ gave the angel and the angel gave to John. There are four characters introduced in the book of John. Four characters. God gave the revelation to Christ. So God is giving things to Christ, just like Christ said would happen when he goes to his God and Father. He says, my God will show me greater things than these so that you may marvel. Why is it that you will marvel? Because you will think, wow, God can give Christ more things. God can make Christ king at his right hand side. And then Christ will submit to his God and father. First Corinthians 15. Christ will submit to his God and father. Christ, Christ will rule for only a thousand years. What God rules for only a thousand years and then gives back the throne to, to his God and father. What sense does that make? And, and, and let me go off on a tangent here. You say hell. Hell. Hell is a place of fire. So why is it that hell is being thrown into a lake of fire? Why is it that hell and death are being thrown into a lake of fire? You see how you don't know the scriptures? Hell is going to be casted into the lake of fire. So hell, if hell is a place of fire, what? Fire is being casted into fire? Can death literally be, be grabbed and thrown into a literal lake of fire? Okay. So this is sim symbolic this is symbolism this is all metaphor this is this is a this is all a, 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 a figure of speech illustrations okay nothing in revelation is literal no examples no illustration in 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 revelation is literal hell and death are being thrown into a lake of fire that tells you that hell is not a place of fire Okay, these are simple things to let you think. Okay, so when people say, Yo, Sam, why don't you believe in what everybody else believes in? Huh? Well, that's why I don't believe in it. One, because everybody believes in it. Since when did everybody know the truth? Since when did the majority hold the truth? Has it not always been the, min the minority, the, the, the select few who knows the truth? Always. And last thing for you guys to think about why does no one ever call on the name of Christ's Father? His name is Yehovah or Jehovah. No one utters the name Jehovah, only Jesus. And Jesus is not even the name of the Son. That is not even the name of the Son. God says, God, the Almighty God, Jehovah, Elohim, He says, My people are people called by my name. What does that mean? His name is in His people's names. 
okay? And you would say, oh, the L, right? So Samuel or Ezekiel, right? Or Daniel, L is in their names. No, L is a title. L is, is, is God. God is a title. The devil is called the God of this wicked system of things. So God is not the name of God. God is a title that many angels hold. In Psalms 82, God says, Yehoah, Elohim, the Almighty. He says, I myself say you are gods, sons of the Most High. Translation, I myself say you are Elo Elohims, sons of the Most High. So El is just a title, is a position like Lord. God called Nebuchadnezzar, the God, the, the, the king of kings. But we know Christ is also called the king of kings. So here it is, a pagan human king is called king of kings. So it's just a title, okay? God is a title, but God is not his name. So when he says my people are, are people called by my name, he's not speaking of the L. He's not speaking of the Samuels and the Daniels and the, and the, and the Ezekiels. And the, because we have um, uh, Jeremiah, right? We have Zephaniah, right? Speaking of the ones who are called by his name. His name is Yehoah or Jehovah, most of the kings were called by God's names directly, his title, like Yehoshaphat, Yeho, Yehoshaphat, which means Yehoah is judge. I think that's what it means. But Yehoah is in the name. You also have um, uh, Yehoiachin. Yehoah is in there. Yehoiachin. You have other names like Yehazabad. You see, God's name is in the names of the kings because they are sitting on his symbolic throne. Just as David is sitting on the symbolic throne of God. Just as Christ is sitting on the symbolic throne of God, but only for a thousand years. That's why Christ is called the greater David. So his people are people called by his name. Is Christ a man called by God's name? Yes, because Christ's name in Hebrew is not Jesus. It's Yehoshua or Jehoshua. You see, Yehoah, Jehovah, Jehoshua. That means Yehoah is my salvation, or Yehovah saves. Christ is called by God's name. But when you say Jesus, God's name is not in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus is a name from Greek, which is Jesus. You know which God's name is in Jesus? Zeus. So we are calling Christ by a name that does not honor his father's name, but honors the pagan Greek God name, Zeus. We, we're calling him Jesus. And in Spanish, we say Jesus, because it derives from, from Greek, it's a Latin, um, um, uh, it derives from Latin. Okay, so we say Jesus, but really it's Jesus, which is really Jesus. So we are honoring the pagan deity Zeus by calling him by, a, by, by we are, his, Zeus's name is in the name of Jesus, not Yehovah. And you always call on Jesus, but you never call on Jehovah. Yes, we, it is by the name of Christ, Yehoshua, that we are saved. But you never utter his father's name. That's why Christ will submit to you. I mean, that's why Christ would will reveal to you and tell you that, yes, you called me by my name several times, but I will confess to you that I never knew you. Get away from me because I never knew you. Okay? So, Sam, why don't you believe in what everybody else believes? For the reasons, for the, for the few reasons that I just gave you right now. I'm going to edit here. I'm going to end it here.